Annyeonghaseyo. Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to you all for joining us today at SOAS's Undergraduate Taster Day. So my name is Grace Ko, and I teach Korean literature and translation in the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at SOAS. The Taster lecture that I will be presenting is from one of the modules that I co-teach with colleagues specializing in Chinese and Japanese literature in the department. The module is called Gender in East Asian Literature, and it is available as a guided option to students in their second year of the BA Chinese, BA Japanese, BA Korean, and BA East Asian Studies degrees. It is also available as an open option to students from other degree programs in the school. As a 15 credit module, it is taught over one term or 10 weeks of classes that consists of a lecture and seminar hour each week. For each class, there are a set of required readings consisting of primary texts or literary works and secondary sources or academic studies related to the literature. We also provide a list of suggested further readings for the final essay assignment, which is a research paper. And so now I will uh, present a portion, well, actually it's, it's kind of a condensed version from one of the lectures entitled Modernization and Gender in Korea, The New Woman, Early Feminism and Romantic Love in Korea from the 1920s to the 1930s. Now, in the words of the historian Kyung Moon Hwang, the Korean Enlightenment, Enlightenment period was characterized by intellectual experimentation and adaptation as the leading intellectuals attempted to reconcile the new ideas and models originating from the West, as well as from contemporary Japan and China. It is associated with the so-called Kabo reforms or Kabo Gyeongjang or Kabo Gyeok in Korean, which began in 1894 and was finalized in 1896. These were a series of major reforms in response to the Donghak peasant revolution in the 19th century. And the reforms were suggested to the Korean court and government during the reign of King uh, Gojong, the last King of Joseon and the first emperor of Korea. Similar to the Meiji Restoration in Japan, the reforms declared, among other things, the abolishment of all forms of legal ownership of people, so slavery, as well as the traditional social class system that had, that had existed in Korea for centuries. By extension, social equality was promoted as was meritocracy for government posts, wider opportunities for education, and fair military conscription. A modern fiscal management system at the level of government was to be developed and merchant monopolies were to be ended. All official documents were to be written in Korean, not classical Chinese, as had been the case until this time. And the reforms also allowed widows to remarry and the age of marriage was raised to 20 for men and 16 for women. So while Korea became independent from China's external interventions at this time, the envisaged future of a sovereign Korea did not last long with the Japanese annexation of Korea in 1910. Since the Korean Enlightenment period and into the Japanese colonial period, many new changes took place that could be considered markers of modernization. These markers could be physical, structural, or conceptual. Some are visible in landscapes. So here we have an image of uh, traditional houses, a photograph of Seoul in 1920, uh, sorry, 1904, prior to the Japanese annexation of Korea, to modern architecture and buildings. So this is a cityscape of Seoul during the Japanese annexation or colonial period. Other markers of urbanization and modernization are things like modern transportation, trams, electricity lines, and generally everything um, that involves urban landscapes. And as we will see in images later on, fashion and clothing are also noticeable as markers of modernity. Other markers were related with modern education and literacy. During the Korean Enlightenment period, there was increasingly more widespread usage of Korean in print culture, including newspapers, including the Daehan Meil Shinbo, later known as Meil Shinbo, which was, which was co-founded by an English journalist named Ernest Bethel and a Korean Yang Gi-tak in 1904. The Daehan Meil Shinbo, or the Korea Daily News, was published in Korean mixed script, in Korean, and in English. And here you have the three different versions on the slide. 
Newspapers became an important platform for literary writers to publish their work, including poetry, short fiction, and serialized fiction, as well as essays, commentaries, letters to the editor, and artwork, including etchings and cartoons. Literary coterie journals were another new form for writers who co-founded and edited them, as well as published their works through them. As many were funded by writers themselves, they were often short-lived, as you might be able to see in uh, the dates of these particular uh, journals. But there were also some that managed to carry on for a longer range of time, for instance, Kebyeok. Um, with Kebyeok though, as the founders and editors were from the Korean religion, Chandogyo background, it had a tumultuous publication history due to numerous instances of confiscation and closure by the colonial government. There were different types of literary journals, including those that were dedicated to poetry and others that focused on translations of world literature into Korean or popular journals that appeared to, that appealed to a wider general audience beyond literary and intellectual circles. With these diverse publication outlets, literary activity thrived in 1920s and 1930s Korea. Though male writers dominated the literary scene, there were a small number of women who also participated quite actively in the modern literary and cultural scene. In the next part of the lecture, I will introduce some of these women writers and what the so-called new woman or Shinyasang in Korean signified through them and in Korean literature and society of its time. Intellectuals, artists, and writers promoted all things enlightened and quote unquote modern, which included the new woman through cultural and printed media. Here in the slide, there are two covers of journals targeted for women published by the Kebyeok group in the early 1930s when Kebyeok itself was in hiatus. Yu Su Yun, a cultural critic in her review of Seo Yuri's book on the topic, postulates that these covers have a surreptitious agenda, an enlightenment strategy akin to a type of propaganda, that through visual imagery, they evoke an idealized image of modernity to have the people or general readership yearn for modernization. They were calling out to its readers to participate in the movement and become modern men and women. But there were other images of the modern woman or modern girl that incited titillating images of women that were subject to scorn and judgment by the public. The cartoon image published in the January 1927 edition of Pyeolgon Gon on the left is a woman in modern clothing haughtily flaunting down the street, attracting much attention over the wall of what looks like a pack of high school boys in an all boys school. The men's gazes are seemingly fixated on her body evoking images of the modern woman as lacking modesty and chastity. The other image on the right, which is a well-known etching, also published in Pelgongon in the same year, depicts a so-called modern girl with a so-called modern boy in a rather exaggerated and farcical manner. And here we have a number of other images that depict different attitudes towards the new woman. In this setting, while the vast majority of published writers were men, there were a number of women writers who participated in the sphere of the literary scene who are considered to be pioneers or the first generation of modern women writers. These include Kim Myung-sun, Kim Won-ju, and Na Hae-seok. Kim Myung-sun on the left of the slide was the first to publish a short story titled Uishime Sonya or A Mysterious Girl in the November 1917 issue of the literary journal Changchun, or Youth, winning a literary competition sponsored by the magazine. Her work garnered praise from Yi Gwangsu, who was a prominent and prolific writer during the colonial period. Then in March 1918, Nahe Sok, on the right, far right, published her first short story, Kyunghee, in a woman's journal, uh, Yeojage. And in March 1920, Kim Won-ju, in the middle, founded her own journal called Shinyaja or New Woman, the first journal published by Korean women with a feminist credo. The journal published essays and fiction by women, including those of Kim Myung-sun, Na Hae-seok, and Kim Won-ju herself. And titles of their works include Tonya uh, Ganan Gil, which is uh, A Maiden's Path, Keshi or Revel uh, Revelation, Onul Sonya Ha, or Death of a Girl, 
which dramatized the suicide of a young girl in protest against her arranged marriage to become a concubine of a wealthy man. There's also an essay by Kim Wonju titled, Uri Shin Yajae Yogo Wa Jujang, which translates as, Our Demands and Claims as New Women. And it was an essay that criticized sexism in Korean society. And then uh, there were other various other examples, for instance, by Na Hae Sok, Sanyeon Jane Ilgi Jung Hae Sok, from my diary four years ago. And uh, her cartoons, including one of Kim Won Ju's busy daily routine as both the journal editor um, and a wife with traditional family duties. I want to draw your attention to Na Hae Sok uh, with examples from her essays, which present early feminist views in modern Korea. Now, Na Hesok's life story is one that includes, as historian Kyung Moon Hwan summarizes succinctly, and I quote, love, romance, family drama, sexual scandal, faith and betrayal, art, politics, nationhood, and modern social change amidst an epic backdrop, end quote, through, through three historical figures or you know, real characters in the love triangle, each a significant figure in Korean history of the Japanese colonial period. Now, Na was first and foremost a painter. Uh, she was also a poet, novelist, essay writer, and one of the pioneers of Korean feminism, along with the, uh, Kim Young Sun and Kim Won Ju, who I mentioned before. She called for changes in society in ways that resonate with feminist slogans and discourses even today. Na was born in 1896 uh, in Suwon, Gyeonggi province to a wealthy family. Her father was an official in the Korean government and the succeeding colonial government. She was sent to study art in Tokyo, Japan in her teens, just prior to the colonial period. And when she returned to Korea at the end of 1910, she worked as a teacher while continuing painting in her own time. She was among the first Korean artists to paint in the European style of oil paintings. She participated in the March 1st independence movement in 1919 and was imprisoned shortly, uh, but subsequently freed. The lawyer who represented her was Kim Woo-young, who was to become her husband. Now their courtship and marriage were voluntary and not arranged, thus considered a quote unquote modern relationship by the standards of their time, historically associated with what is known as tayu yone, literally translated as free love, but it's more to do with um, you know, pe people having a choice to choose uh, whom they wish to marry. Both have gone down uh, in history as very modern and progressive people. Na was Kim's second wife, and he promised and enabled her to pursue her painting career, which began with her works entering in a special exhibition sponsored by the colonial government two years after the March 1st movement. Though his family was historically middle class, with the changes that took place in Korea with the Kabul reforms, colonization, and modernization, Kim rose the ranks to become a high-level official in the 1920s and later became one of the highest ranking Koreans in the Japanese imperial government, for which he was deemed a Japanese collaborator after the liberation of Korea in 1945. I mention all this because to highlight that Kim's status allowed him and his wife to travel abroad to Manchuria, America, and Europe in the 1920s. So Na, Na Hesok sojourned in Paris, France for nearly a year to study painting when she met and started a scandalous love affair with the Korean social activist and Chandogyo leader Choi Rin, who was 20 years older than her. When Na Hesok returned to Korea, as a result of her affair with Che that caused a great public scandal, her husband divorced her with full custody of their children. Na's stories proves that in spite of modernization, Korea still largely remained a traditional society when it came to perceptions of gender roles and family. Though she was a public figure whose reputation became tarnished by her affair and divorce, Na did not passively accept her situation. She sued her former lover, Che, for abandoning her after, quote, violating her chastity, demanding monetary compensation for the losses she suffered as a result of their affair. As a writer who regularly contributed essays of social criticism throughout her life, particularly on women's social status, family life, and what she believed to be, con to be the contradictions and double standards of modern Korean society. After her divorce, she published a series of confessional essays in popular journals like Samcheolli, including a famous piece called Ihon Gobekso, or Confessional Thoughts on Divorce, 
that was published in two parts in 1934. And here, this is an excerpt from her, Ihon Gobek So, which included many other controversial yet intelligent criticisms of men and Korean society's double standards. As bold and accurate as she was in her essays, as her biographer Yi Guyeol put it, the publication of, uh, of her piece proved to be, and I quote, an act of self-annihilation and a masochistic sarcasm flung at her own society, end quote, as the public reaction was one of dis disbelief and condemnation. Her final years were lived alone in relative poverty and isolation. In this transitional period of modernization, new ideas and concepts were introduced, including romantic love, which not only became a popular theme and storylines for Korean literary works, but which was also conceptualized as a significant marker of modernity in different ways by different writers. So for instance, above and beyond its basic meaning relevant to the actors or characters involved, romantic love, like many other new concepts, represented a predicament of life and society at large. For example, romantic love signified the freedom of choice in marriage, and by extension, individual freedom to act outside traditional conventions, something new and extravagant that could have an impact on the course of societal mores over time. Of course, there were different opinions among different writers, such as Yi Gwang Su on the left, who believed it was part of a broader social action, whilst for writers like Kim Dong In on the right, um, romantic love itself could not change social values, whereby it invalidated relationships conceived in any other than simple physical terms. Yi Wangsu's Mujang, uh, or Heartless, labeled as the first modern Korean novel, has as its main characters modern men and modern women who advocate education, studying abroad, and Tai Yane, or the freedom to court and choose whom to marry. In spite of the grand images of the new woman and free love, uh, or the right to choose whom to marry, financial independence and careers for women were limited in reality. Working in factories uh, came to be seen as an opportunity for women to be employed and receive an income. Though the hours were long and the conditions frequently not favorable, like Tai Yone or free love, uh, becoming a factory girl was seen as a way of being independent and in control of one's own. So for all the discourse on the new woman, free love, and women's liberation, which emerged alongside a westernized Japanese colonial version of modernization in Korea in the early 20th century, how these concepts were accepted or realized in its times seemed to have been limited and contentious. In Korea, Traditional gender roles remain strongly embedded in social customs and in the people's minds, which caused a rift between the minority, minority pioneers or rebels, as society saw them, of early Korean feminists. The middle image on the slide is another cover of the journal Shin Hong, which was first launched in 1923, when new women was emerging as a new problematic and sensational concept. The image on the right, is of an essay in a January 1925 issue of Shin Yeosong, which is titled Women's Liberation and Our Inevitable Demand. The caption for, for the photo on the left with the two women states that there was a trend during the 1920s where educated men would frequently leave their wives in their hometown and take in a modern girl as their concubine, which led to the growing rivalry between new and more traditional women between the uh, new women and more traditional women and resentment by the latter group, which formed the majority of the female population at the time. This continued to be the negative image and judgment of the new woman and what she represented later in the 1930s. So for all their modern and progressive agenda, when it came to the new woman concept, it did not fully realize itself, but in not only Korean society, but also others, including Japan, China, and in the West, where the concept first developed in the, um, around the same time. In spite of this, in our times, when new feminist movements are active and more prevalent in Korean society than ever before, it is interesting to see how the discourse and rhetoric of the early Korean new women writers resonate strongly with the issues and problems that were being raised 
questioned and criticized by femini Korean feminists today. Some questions to consider though are the relationship between perceived notions of gender and modernization, particularly when they stem from colonialism. Then how gender roles are articulated and assigned historically and in present day discourses. And finally, the ways in which we understand or identify so-called gendered characteristics or elements such as values and emotions and their representations. So this ends my taster lecture. So uh, it's a condensed version. And in the seminar sessions, I would then normally chair a discussion among students regarding their reaction or responses to the readings, lecture, and questions for consider consideration assigned each week. But at this juncture, before we take questions, I want to thank you all for joining in. 감사합니다. And since it is the start of the Korean Lunar New Year, the Year of the Ox, I would also like to say in Korean, 새해 복 많이 받으세요, or Happy New Year. So we welcome any questions from the audience, either related to the lecture content or our Korean and East Asian studies degrees at SOAS. Thank you very much. So I'll stop sharing the screen now and um, come back to join me. Thank you. Great, so we've had a few questions into the chat. Um, so one of the first questions um, was from Jess Little and she says she's curious about the year abroad. She's intending to do either politics and social or social anthropology with Korean. And she wanted to know when uh, will her year abroad be? And are there any details on uh, where it will be, costs, etc. Okay, thank you, Jess. So at this juncture, I also want to introduce you very briefly in case um, I have to ask. <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce to you um, Dr. Alan Cummings, who is also one of the panelists, who is our, the associate head of our department and also um, uh, handles admissions for the department as well. So I may have to <laughs> ask Alan at some points, but I think this question I can ask, uh, I can answer, and that is, um, if, if you are a joint degree, whether you're a joint degree student or a single subject student, uh, the year abroad in Korea takes place in the third year. So it used to be in the second year, but um, it, it's changed now. And in terms of uh, details on costs for accommodation, we don't have that online, but usually what happens is, is that every year um, in term two, so actually around this time, uh, students have uh, various briefing sessions with the year abroad coordinator when all those information, uh, so including um, accommodation, applications, visa, you know, modules uh, to be taken in Korea, etc. Everything is uh, basically provided, uh, including, I believe, a briefing pack, so-called like briefing pack. Um, so uh, I'm unable to give you the specific details because uh, it's something that I, um, I'm unfamiliar with. But if you did have, I know this is a very common question that uh, students have. Um, so I'm just wondering, Alan, is there a way that maybe students can get in touch with someone for this information? Um, I, I, th I think you know, the information that we normally kind of give you at this stage is just to say that you know, students, um, you know, it, it's always quite a mixed pattern. Um, you know, there's some students who want to live in, in dormitories at, at Korean universities, and there's a process by which you can apply uh, for that accommodation. Uh, but, you know, some of that accommodation kind of quite, um, shall I say, strict rules. Um, so lots of students also choose not to stay in university accommodation, uh, and they, you know, they, they find somewhere to rent, you know, a flat uh, near, near the university sometimes uh, with some friends. Um, so, you know, obviously, there's going to be quite a difference between privately rented accommodation and obviously with that there's kind of really really cheap to really expensive it just kind of depends upon your, your own capabilities but university accommodation itself is not is not particularly expensive um but like grace i don't have the, the precise figures here and obviously it changes a bit from year to year but you know if you want to write to me i can try to get you some more information um on that um and yeah so it it, it is in the in the third year so Maybe sh shall we go to the go to the next question uh, then, which is somebody has anonymously asked. This is one for you, Grace. I think where would I be able to read works by uh, Na Hai Sok? Na Hai Sok, yes, Apologies very good. My horrible. <laughs> no, that's okay. That's a very good question. So I don't know if um, um, the participants today will be 
able to access the recording uh, because it was in my PowerPoint slides. So unfortunately, not as many of her works are available in English translation, but um, there are a few and um, translated by Kim Young Hee. So uh, I showed a slide, for example, with um, some English translation from her uh, confessions, uh, confessions on divorce. Uh, but there's also a short story by her Kyung Hee, which is available in English translation. So um, I think for that, if I were to maybe Kim or someone else, uh, or you can email me, <laughs> you can email me and I can provide you with the full reference uh, for, for that particular uh, work. Yeah, we will be sending out the recording um, through an email. So again, following that um, email you received with the recording, if you do have further questions or follow-up questions after that, we can always make sure that we send out um, further information to you on that as well. Thank you. Okay. Okay, and then I think another question that has come through says, if I don't take um, this specific degree, are the modules, um, Oh, can you take modules from this course, basically? Uh, I, can, I can answer that one, if you like. Um, yeah, so on every degree at SOAS, there will be some modules which are identified as being open option modules, which means that anybody in any department in the school is able to, to take them. Um, most, you know, the, the, you know, if you look on the website, you can find the structure for, for, you know, for all of our degrees. Uh, and generally, you know, in for many for many degrees in year one, you won't have any open options. But you know, in your second year and your third year, you will have open option modules where you can choose to do, you know, a language, or you can choose to, you know, if if you're taking economics and you're really interested in, I don't know, Tibetan religion, you can go off and take a you know a module in Buddhism. Um, so yeah, that there that there is yeah. So some of our our modules are available to students in other departments, and. You know, I guess if you're if you've come to this talk, you're perhaps interested in Korean language. Uh, so we do have um, you know a, a step sequence of Korean language modules that students from any department in the school can can take. Uh, I guess I can introduce the next question. Uh, so Siri, you've asked. I've been studying Korean for about seven years, uh, and you're wondering if you have to start at the beginning of the course or not. Uh, I'm happy to take that one as well. Um, Basically, if you have studied some Korean before, um, when you arrive, we can give you a placement test. Um, and depending upon the result of that placement test, we can begin you at a higher level. Um, you know, it's never good for um, you know, students who are absolute beginners uh, and more advanced students to be in the same class because the more advanced students get, you get bored. Uh, and you know, the less advanced students, the beginner students, it, it just feels a little daunting to them to have somebody in the class who's kind of sitting there at the back kind of rolling their eyes going, you're still doing this stuff. This is really easy. Um, so yeah, we always try to put you at a level that's going to be that's going to be right for you. And there's a placement test that we would, that we can get you to sit, to figure out what that level uh, might be. Um, I guess I think the next question is probably one for for you, Grace. Yes, thank you. So I'll just read out the question, um, and this is from Agnes Arnold. So because of the development of feminism coinciding with general modernization. Is there a degree to which the early feminists absorbed the rhetoric of the Enlightenment without critical analysis? And was there a harmful aspect to this relationship? That's a very good question. And just to clarify, um, so when, what, when I mentioned Enlightenment in the Korean context, it's uh, firstly specifically pertaining to a Korean Enlightenment, which is different from uh, the Enlightenment movement in, in Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, um, if we consider any rhetoric, that involves like uh, in light, kind of new ideas. I think um, there are there have been many different um, scholarship uh, since, particularly uh, sort of the end of the last century and uh, certainly in the twenty first century, reevaluating um, these uh, early feminist discourses. And I think there is always that danger at any new at any juncture when new ideas emerge and uh, intellectuals engage with them particularly when um, some of the ideas were those that were imported from, from abroad. Uh, I think in its time, the way that people engage with them, there are sort of um, critical approaches. Uh, so, uh, so there would be some level of critical analysis, but also depending on the particular political agenda that you know, intellectuals or writers feel are necessary or urgent to that time, uh, they might sort of make use of these rhetorics, you know, to suit 
uh, their needs uh, for its time. But then I think historically then fast forward a century later, and then the way that we then evaluate and analyze whether, you know, the extent to which they were critical enough and whether perhaps by uh, disappropriating without, you know, uh, kind of challenging its views um, sufficiently enough, whether that was harmful. I think we get different kinds of answers in different periods. And it really kind of shows us also the, the, the paradigmatic shift uh, between um, the, the time of the reception, so to speak. So um, I think if this is a very good question. And all I can say for now is, is that there are various different studies that, that do engage with this, with this problem. Okay. And then the next question from Alia is, uh, for those of us who have been studying Korean for a few years, what level will be beginning the course at and how is this decided? I think this is similar to what uh, Dr. Cummings mentioned earlier. So usually we increasingly now for Korean, um, we have many students who come to us and say that, you know, they've self-studied or they've studied Korean. So um, at the beginning, there's usually a language placement test uh, during enrollment to determine, um, you know, uh, which level classes that students um, can enter. And uh, the difference between the classes, obviously, I mean, they're quite intensive. So sometimes students might think that they should be in the second year, but actually because of the content that's covered throughout the first year is quite fast paced and quite, you know, intensive, they might be placed in the first year um, module, but with the advice that think of the first bit as review. And then at some point when we catch up, <laughs> you know, it will advance very quickly. So um, there are placement tests, tests at the beginning, which um, then kind of determine. And then we have our language teachers who are there to answer any specific questions about the different uh, modules. Okay. Great, and I can probably take the next one. Um, so again, there's been a question raised. Um, so hello, are there any um, temporary long distance learning opportunities for students who are unable to enter the UK due to COVID or visa issues um, at SOAS. So currently for this year, we have um, kind of employed that approach because obviously we are still pretty much um, in kind of a, a, a high risk area in terms of COVID. And obviously we know that uh, during the last year, in order for students to make those decisions at the time when, you know, we didn't really know what was going to happen. Uh, we allowed for our students to join us through um, distance learning and obviously um, our learning was online. Uh, moving forward to this year, we are continuing to evaluate that. Um, and as we get um, closer to the summer, we will be looking at what the situation is like in the UK, but also what the situation is like globally and how that impacts on both kind of travel, but also on visa issues. So we're in constant communication with the UK VI and talking to them about various different practices and processes that we can put in place for students um, to be able to make sure that we get them all the way through from applying to us, accepting their offers to us, and then getting their visas and being able to come over. So it is something that we um, are very aware of. It is something that we are looking into and we will continue to advise you of that as soon as we can as the year progresses. But if we do need to, we can put those, um, those kind of allowances into place for students. Okay, thank you. And I think I'll take the next question because it's uh, in relation to uh, the lecture content, I suppose. So the question was uh, from George, with the rise of the new ideas of gender through K-pop and Korean media, do you believe that the challenges that face these women is facing modern views of gender in Korean society today. So what I gathered from that question, what you're asking is perhaps the way that um, K-pop and Korean media representations are also kind of projecting, you know, new ideas of, of gender and um, in relation to women, but also men. And there, there are lots of interesting studies um, that are coming out um, that are looking at uh, the different kind of image and representations of gender with uh, popular culture um, and globalization and media. Um, so certainly, yes, at every juncture, the ways in which a society uh, sort of um, comes up with ideas of gender is certainly, you know, uh, obviously um, affected not, not only by intellectual discourse, but also more so than ever, you know, in our times with technology and, 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 and such uh, with, with popular kind of representations of that. So 
Okay, and then the next question from um, Sankavi is related, I suppose, to uh, the UCAS application. So it says, hi, I wanted to know if there were any recommended books for Korean studies for A-level students to prepare for this course or to put on our UCAS application. Um, that's a very good question. <laughs> it's not something, unfortunately, that we can, there, unfortunately, there is no one book <laughs> that you know, necessarily says, here's like Korean studies. I think it, it all depends on students' particular interests. And if you go on the website and there are like, uh, we have our undergraduate modules and all the details for each module. And um, not all of them, but many of them kind of list, uh, you know, readings, right? Mm -hmm. So there are a whole host of different types of uh, reading materials and depending on your interests, I think I would encourage you to, 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 to look at um, our undergraduate pages, the module pages. Yeah, and, and I, would, I would probably add to that in terms of your UCAS application and kind of what you might wanna include with that. Um, even though it's important to think about what outside reading you might do outside of say your current um, classes um, and schooling that you're taking, it doesn't necessarily always have to be um, an academic resource that you're reading. What we want to know is how you're currently engaging in this particular subject area or why you're even interested in this particular subject area. And it doesn't have to be that you've read every single resource on it and you're an expert in it, because if you were an expert in it, you probably wouldn't be coming to study it with us uh, because you know it already. But it's more just to see how you kind of gain that first interest. And so usually when I'm talking to students, particularly about what they might put in their personal statement, it's it could be an experience, it could be an article that you wrote, it could be a TV program that you watched, um, it could be having uh, maybe some friends or family from a particular area. So really we just wanna know where that interest kind of sprung from and, and how you think you're gonna take that interest further. So it's not to say that you need to reel off a list of um, books that you've read, but more talk about what you read in those books, what interests you in. And it even doesn't have to be um, that you agree with that. In a lot of senses, we want to see what you've read and then possibly what your views on that are kind of moving forward and how it might change every time you read a new text or you know a new article or engage in a different way. So that's kind of my suggestion to you in terms of that. Thank you. And then uh, there was a question about what months, uh, from what months does a school, a year abroad run? Uh, for Korean, um, it's from September. So 1st of September is when uh, the Korean semester starts. Um, so just to answer that question very quickly. And then the next question was, how is the decision of which partner universities in particular you go to abroad made? So before, when our numbers were smaller, when we used to sp um, send students to one institution, uh, that was an issue. But now as we have more universities, um, it's based on a sort of meritocracy, I suppose, your, your, your marks. So I think you, you put down uh, the university, like first choice, second choice, and um, usually depending on your grades, uh, the year abroad coordinator or the program convener will assess that. And, and depending on how you do in the first term and leading up to the time of application, which is around, as I said, the second term, um, then uh, students are told uh, which partner universities that uh, they, will, they, they, they can apply for. And then the other, the question after that is related to the content of the lecture. So Juju asks, if there was a social stigma around the Korean new women due to them transgressing social expectations, why were they seen as more desirable for men to the point they would abandon their wives for them? That is a very good question. And I think that's a perennial <laughs> question. But as I pointed out, what was interesting was, was that they were typically taken as concubines. You know, So in that last example that I pointed where there were rifts between the more traditional women was because men would marry the more traditional women, uh, leave them in the countryside, <laughs> and then for work or whatever else, they would have their modern you know, sort of new women <laughs> as girlfriends or concubines or what have you. So, but it is a very good question for which I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. It's um, I think it's 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 a question that you know uh, that 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 could be investigated in different ways. But and I think maybe also sometimes when you, you when you look at this, it could be the stigma is more associated to the woman than to the man. So, it, it, and I think that's quite common in a number of different, uh, I guess, different cultures that you can see this occur in, in terms of, of that kind of stigma. 
Absolutely. Yes, Kim, I think you're spot on there. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so then uh, other questions. I think some, hopefully, uh, um, from what we previous questions or answers might have addressed. So the next question was, I've been studying Korean independently for two years now. Do I have to start from beginner Korean? So again, you'll be placed. And then what would the year abroad affect someone with a pre-settled status? Ah, um, Kim or Alan? Uh, well, I, I, I think, you know, the, the rules I've read are around, are around settled status. I think once you have settled status, which is when you've been, when you've had pre-settled status for what, five years or something, um, then you're able to leave the UK for up to a year for, you know, for study, which the year abroad would be classified as study. Uh, but with pre-settled status, I think, I think when you're, you're still allowed to to leave, you have to come and go from the UK. It's not like you're imprisoned in the UK when you have pre-settled status. Um, but uh, I think you know that that's whether your whether your status would kind of revert after coming back after having been away for six months or or longer. I'm not quite sure. So um, we can, yeah, we, we would need to kind of look at what the Home Office is currently saying about that. I'll note that one down and um, add it to a kind of a follow-up email um, for us. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I can also take Rihanna's question, which is how much the BA Korean covers Korean history, culture, in comparison to language modules. Um, well, you can you can see the whole syllabus for the degree uh, on the website. Um, so in first year, fifty percent of what you do is language, um, and fifty percent there's uh, the other fifty percent is there's a a course called reading and writing, which is like a, a university study skills module. Um, there's a module called K culture, which is about Korean popular culture, uh, and then there's another module called uh, East Asian Civilization, which covers Korean history, but it also covers Chinese and Japanese history as well. Um, so in first year, it's 50-50. Um, that that you know, proportion it changes a little bit through each year, um, but you can see the full the full syllabus on the website. And you know, normally each year you will have a you know, substantial language module uh, or perhaps several language modules that you can you can take. Um, and of course, you also have a choice, you know, the further you go up through into second year and fourth year, uh, you have a widening choice of things you can take as well. So you can, you can kind of sculpt your degree to, to look the way you want it uh, to look. Um, I think that's, that's probably similar, you know, the same answer to, to Malian's question. Do you get to taught the language as well, the political system? Uh, yeah, so we, we, you know, we understand language as existing within a culture. So in order to speak Korean properly, you need to understand Korean culture and society so we teach you uh, we teach you both things uh, so you know so it's not it's not just a language school it's a university so we want also to train you to how to think uh, how to think about and read about and understand uh, you know the culture and the society and the history of, of the region you're studying um, shy has got a question conditional offer and the condition you get a distinction in BTech and two A's at a level um, I think that's a really specific question. Yeah, I can I can get back to you um, on that one. Um, so I'll put my email address in, and then if you want to um, email me on that further, then we can go ahead and, and discuss that as well. For you. I'll just put that into the um, the Q and the A. Okay. And then the next uh, question, which is one that many applicants have, is to do with a. Uh, Oh, sorry, I think I, oh, what can a degree in things related to Korean culture take you in terms of work in Korea? Well, our graduates have gone in various different diverse paths. There are those who are, um, you know, in Korea teaching English or doing further studies or working for companies. Um, uh, in the case of um, other students, out, um, people go into various different uh, diverse uh, career paths. But in relation, I think what, I, I'm guessing what you're asking is um, what a degree, you know, doing a BA degree, like, is that kind of advantageous? What, what can that get you? It depends on your own interests of what kinds of work that you're looking for. What I can tell you is um, in Korea, uh, in, we now have increasingly more um, foreigners, uh, you know, wanting to come and work in Korea. But uh, I think those with a degree in career related subjects who can speak Korean, that's, you know, almost always certainly very much appreciated 
by prospective employers in Korea. So there is that advantage that although there might be different job opportunities, um, to have that pre-knowledge of Korean culture and language could definitely, you know, help students for those people who are uh, interested in, 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 in finding work in Korea later on. So, uh, and then in terms of the next questions about how is the course assessed, again, all the details can be found on the website because each module has uh, different methods of assessment. So some involve exams uh, and other continuous assessments. Others um, are based on just essays or portfolio or oral presentations. So each module has slightly different assessment um, methods. And, and those are find in the, found in the individual uh, des um, descriptions of, of, of each module. Um, and then is there any specific information about taking Korean and linguistics as a combined degree? So for all combined degrees, uh, the information again is online. If you go to the BA Korean and, for example, a, a program page, then, and if you look under the structure, it'll tell you sort of what the structure would look like, but typically it's half and half. So, mm -hmm. and in, in the half and half for joint degree students, uh, uh, particularly in um, the sort of first two years, it's, it's very much a guided curriculum. So you won't, you might not have as many uh, sort of alternative op like options that you can take, but there'll be certain core compulsory, you know, modules that are required for the Korean side as well as the linguistics side. But uh, there'll be a combination, in the case of the Korean side, it'll be a combination of language and particularly in the upper years, um, uh, other kind of content, you know, culture, history and those types of modules. Grace, could I just add something on that? Because sure. I, I think that's something that's maybe a little bit confusing about the SARS website. So if mm. you want to do uh, a joint degree, you, you need to look at two different web pages in order to discover what the content of that degree is. So to find the Korean stuff, as Grace has said, you, you go to the East Asia department website and you look up BA Korean and, and it will give you the structure for the combined degree. And then for the linguistic side, you need to go to, uh, you need to go to languages, cultures and linguistics there uh, their website and look under BA Linguistics and, so their combination degree, and that will give you the, the structure for the linguistics side of it. Mm -hmm. So you need to look in both places to get the full picture. Um, and then I think for the next question, uh, there's a question on, are there clubs or societies to join at SOAS to learn Korean if you don't want to take it as a degree? Well, there are, there's a lot of different societies that you could join um, to, to possibly have a little bit of an introduction to um, Korean um, as a language, but also to the cultural side of things. Um, and then there are a lot of students who do kind of just language sharing. So, you know, they can teach you Korean if you can help them with their English sometimes, um, or possibly other languages if you're coming from European countries. Um, but also there is the opportunity to take language classes as part of another degree at SOAS. So if you are taking a politics degree or a development studies degree or an economics degree, we do allow you to take um, a number of language modules as you're going through your program. And I think sometimes for, for students who are maybe beginners, who feel maybe a little bit worried about taking that step into kind of a language, um, the fact that you can take that in your first year um, does provide them with a little bit more confidence in, in doing so. Um, and what I might just do is uh, maybe I can ask um, Christabel to uh, give maybe her experience of different societies that she's joined as a student with us. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi. Hi, hello. Um, so my name is Christabel. I am currently a law and Korean student at SOAS in my second year. And um, about societies, there's, there's quite a lot. I was quite, when I first came, I was quite overwhelmed. There was so many, I wanted to join them all. But the uh, ones that I do find quite interesting, there's like a Korean society, which um, I'm still currently in. And right now it hosts very um, like vast opportunities where you can start doing um, language exchanges and you can meet other people who are doing the same degree as you. And sometimes they're not even doing Korean or um, doing a language at all. Sometimes they just want to join and then they can learn other things from this society. They can, because they can speak to each other about um, the culture and the history and everything like that. And there's also 
a Korean dance society. I believe that still runs. I'm not entirely sure, but that they you explore the historical um, aspects of Korean dance and you uh, also get to learn different dances, which is really cool. And then recently there's a K-pop society, which is really cool as well, uh, which I'm still in. And sadly, like because of the situation we're in currently, we're trying to um, come together on Zoom and then discuss things that we can do outside of um, when lockdown is over and things like that. And the other societies, oh, if I can remember, there's... I mean, it's hard to remember. We've got about two there's, there's quite, We've got <laughs> quite a lot of societies, yeah. But those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. But I think the Korean society at the moment, this one's the most, like, very active uh, currently. And I believe that it's, it's very good for when you, before you come into the university, you can, I believe the, the Facebook page is up as well. You can have a look and see what they do. And yeah, it's quite, it's quite interesting. Sorry, I saw another question as well. Yeah, yeah, K-pop society is very fun. I do agree. I read the comment about um, K-pop society. It is very fun. You meet very lovely people, different types of people. They're all in different years. There's some that in fourth year, there's some in third year, first year. Oh, they're, they're so amazing. You get to have a good time, you know, discuss the, the songs you like and things like that and dance and go to competitions as well. That's another big thing which is really fun. I've been to quite a few and I've had my my fair share of wins and losses. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. So, I mean, that's great. It just goes to show you there's lots of different ways that you can engage. And even once you're at the university, there'll be lots of different open um, lectures and events that we run. Um, and we don't just say it has to be a student who studies Korean. It could be a student studying any, um, any programme with us who wants to go along to those events. There's lots for you to, to see and do. Um, you can also audit additional classes, though I always do say um, for the students who are studying a language, the auditing of additional classes is something that should be considered very carefully because um, it's not to say that any one degree is harder than another, um, but you could say in terms of language, uh, in terms of the, the time taken to learn them, it can be a little bit more um, of a commitment, so that might just be something you want to think about in terms of structuring um, your year and your classes and what you decide to do. Shall, shall, shall we have like a, a lightning round to try to get through yes. <laughs> yes. really quickly? Because we, we, we are just about to run out of time, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so anonymous attendee, your question about can you send an additional personal statement? Yes, you can. Uh, you can send that to the admissions office uh, and then they will add it to your application. Uh, Madison, how many students should you take the BA Korean BA course? Grace, do you know how many we have in K100 this year? I think we've got about 70 maybe. Oh, you're, you're muted. It's anywhere from 50 to 70. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Um, so some of these are kind of questions which Grace might be able to answer better, but I'll, I'll just kind of steam through a couple more. Uh, will there be an opportunity to take the topic test uh, during the course? Yes. Um, you know, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Sort of several <laughs> times a year. I think they're, you know, they're not, not all of them are running this year because of COVID, but yeah, you can, you can apply for that. How long does it take to finish the course? Uh, BA Korean, either single or joint degree is a four year uh, degree. Um, how does the year abroad affect students taking a, taking a, I guess you're asking about a joint honors degree maybe, Elizabeth? Um, so yeah, in year three, when you're studying in Korea, you are only studying um, modules which are related to Korean. So if you're doing Korean and economics, you won't have any economics modules when you're in Korea. You, know, you may be able to audit some you know, economics modules in Korean at the university you're at, but that depends upon that university's uh, policy. Um, Jazz, you've asked about attending uh, additional uh, language modules. That's going to depend upon the structure of that particular degree. As Grace has said, joint degrees often have quite a fixed curriculum. Uh, but you normally have an open option module probably in your final year. So you may be able to take an additional uh, language module uh, then. Um, Matthew, could you be rejected by one apart department and uh, accepted by the other? Um, yes, that, could, that can happen uh, sometimes. In that case, the admissions office will get back to you and say, do you want to be accepted? Do you, do you want to change your application to just a single subject degree? Um, 
what effect does leaving the EU have on fees for people who have EU citizens that live for the live in the UK for a long time? I think Kim, that's maybe one for you. Do you have a a lightning answer on that? Um, yes. Yeah, so it depends um, how long you've been in the UK for and whether you would be um, able to access uh, pre-settled or settled status. So we would do a um, a uh, fees questionnaire for you on that one, enabled to uh, for us to determine which you would be for us. Um, the fees questionnaire is the same at every university, but universities can make different decisions on it. So um, it's well worth, if you're applying to lots of different universities, to ask each of them for a fees questionnaire. Uh, and Benedetta, your question about the combined degree, I think that's that's the same question. So in the year abroad, you don't do any any classes that, that that are for your you know for the other half of your degree, uh, so you'll take you know you'll take your economics modules or your politics modules in first year, second year, and your final year. Okay. And the one question that was specific to the sorry gender in Korea was, uh, if well, it was to do with whether polygamy. Sorry, how prevalent legal was the polygamy system in Korea at this time? Actually, polygamy was and still is illegal, which is why uh, men, but men may have taken concubines, but not second wives. So that's that's the distinction. Um, and I also answered them some questions on the chat. So, um, but just quickly, because someone had asked about um, whether there are other universities in addition to Sogang and Korea University for the year abroad. And my answer was yes, there are other universities that are being added for the year abroad as our student numbers grow. <laughs> um, and um, then there was one question about my email. So I have also put that up, but I think that will also be, it's available online. It's gk5 at soas.ac.uk. And um, you're welcome to uh, email me about questions about Nahezok or some of the resources uh, from the lecture that I mentioned. Uh, and if you, have, if you have any questions about the degree as a whole or about the application process, um, well, you can write to me. I'm the admissions tutor for the department. So my, my email is ac50 at soas.ac.uk. I'll stick that in, uh, in chat uh, as well. Uh, and you can also write, of course, to the, uh, the admissions uh, office if you have you know, particularly kind of specific technical questions uh, about uh, you know, applying with certain qualifications or about fees or about visas or those kinds of questions. And but anything else? about you know, the, the degree, send it to me. <laughs> right. And there was one, uh, one question that I think um, hasn't been answered, but it was, had, again, had to do with opportunity learned about the Rousseau and Korea's journey to modernization. Yes, there are history modules or history related modules. So all that fun stuff <laughs> is, is taught across these uh, different modules. Okay, well, thank you so much, everybody, for attending today. And thank you for all of your great questions. We hope it was really helpful. Um, I think it just obviously shows you that there's so much more uh, to delve into. Um, and so do feel free to reach out to us if you have any um, follow-up questions. You will get um, an email from, uh, from our team with a recording um, link attached to it. And then if you do have any follow-up questions from there, please do uh, feel free to respond to that email. And then we'll hopefully be running some further sessions as we get closer um, to the time. So if you uh, receive an email from us inviting you to further sessions and you can attend, please feel free to do so. Um, it just gives you a bit more of an insight into SOAS, into the program that you might take um, and into areas that you might want to explore uh, throughout the next three or four years um, or for further on from then. So, so yeah, thank you all for attending. Uh, thank you to Grace for a great lecture. Uh, thank you for Kim for organizing. And thank you for Christabel for giving your insight into the student experience on that the degree. Okay. And yes. thank you all for attending, guys. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Christabel. Thank you, Alan. And thank you thank all. You. And <laughs> I see some uh, applicants have written it in Korean. <laughs> so happy new year um, and take good care of yourselves. Keep well. <laughs>